give that citation last time. And we talked about the Holocaust at the beginning and about the, the, the let me put it this way, the horrible things that took place in the Holocaust and the horrible things that took place during communist persecution. And uh, however, through all this, we talked about beauty and about uh, beautiful human beings. And what I like to introduce you today is a beautiful human being, well, Ms. Magda Brown, and she will tell you her stories and you will find uh, more about her from herself. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am going to ask a question before I give my testimony. Since most of you are from Illinois, how many of you received Holocaust education in middle school or high school? Mm, good. But then there are many of them who did not. So for their benefit, I'll give my testimony in more detail. So bear with me. Anyhow. I was born in Hungary and grew up in a normal religious family, probably just like any other. Matter of fact, when I got to middle school, so six graders, I have one and only show and tell, and that is my eighth grade graduation picture. <laughs> and I do this not to show value. I show it to the children to make them understand that I wasn't any different than any of them in the classroom. I did my homework. I didn't do my homework. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's not me do at, at six graders and as they go there. To, to make them understand what can happen from one minute to the next. The pendulum swings and everything goes topsy turvy. So with that in mind, let me tell you about a little, a little history. I am not a historian. I only got my testimony. But I have to intertwine history here to get a fuller picture of the contrast between the tragedies of the Holocaust in Eastern Europe versus Hungary. Okay. Now, here it goes. As you have studied now your schooling so far about the Second World War, the onset of uh, Hitler's rise of power, the tragedies beginning of uh, anti-Semitic and, and disliking many other non-Jewish people as well. You have heard about his dislike for the homosexuals and for the gypsies and for the Jehovah Witnesses and so forth and so forth. So all this is building up in the 1930s in Germany. As the onset of the Second World War, 1939, the Nazi army parades into different Eastern European countries. Once they enter, let's use a country Poland, heavy Jewish population, they enter the country and systematically they take the people out of their home into concentration camp and the killing machine begins, 1939. Congress, we are in Hungary. Hungary is an ally of Germany. Germany is staying out of Hungary. And in comparison to the other fellow Jews in the other countries, we are relatively comfortable. Now, it's a loose term to say comfortable, but in contrast so, because the Comfort zone comes in for us. We are still able to live in our own homes. Up to a point, we still have jobs and other social assistance. That will come to an end. But again, I'm running the comparison between the two worlds. So what, has, what happens to us in Hungary from 39 to 1944 all the anti-Jewish laws, you have studied the Nuremberg laws, and these are all anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish laws, which was enacted in Germany, and thus it gets transformed into Hungarian language, and the Hungarian parliament uh, appears to all these rulings, and all of a sudden we are bombarded by a whole series of anti-Jewish laws. It would take hours to describe in details how many there were, but let me single out about two or three of them to give, make, give you a picture about it. 
Uh, for instance, let's go to the military. Until about 1939, 1940, all young men, regardless of their religious background, would enter the military. And of course, in those days, they were all male military personnel. And they would enter at a precise age, serve their duty, and that's it. Matter of fact, my father was a very proud, very patriotic Hungarian soldier in the First World War. And he had his medals and dedications that he was super proud like any soldier would be. Now what happens in 1940? They begin these anti-Jewish laws and it deals with the Jewish young man can no longer wear the country's uniform, can no longer bear arms, However, he still has to enter the military. So how does that play out? Just like when our children be sent off to overnight camp and have to dress them in their personal clothing, my brother was five years my senior, and at, in 1942 he was military age. So my parents had to outfit him with completely personal belongings, and now he enters the military compound the Hungarian military <coughs> And here is another little trickery. When uh, the, the average soldier enters a military compound, they have total freedom to have passes to go uh, visit the family or etc. I don't have to elaborate on that. The Jewish boy no longer can go out. So in a sense, he's already in prison. And if that's not enough, he has to wear a yellow armband further indicating that he is Jewish. Second, he receives tremendous physical and mental abuse. And he is, the Jewish boys are given the most menial job regardless of their educational intellect and so on. Uh, many, many, many rudenesses happen. So this is another thing. Now let's skip on to the educational world. New law comes where professors, scientists, journalists, pharmacists get the, get the pink slip from one day to the next. They're no longer being employed in any, any government agencies or anywhere, any universities and so forth. Now think in terms of a human being, a family person. Let's say that professor had a wife and children, and perhaps older parents to support. Now he's jobless. Multiply this by the thousands. There's no such a thing as social services or welfare services from the government. So the Jewish community has to merge and try to support these families for years to come. Like I said, there are many, many other things. There is one law that affected me personally. In about the 1920s, Hungary was anti-Semitic already. 1920s, they invented a law, and I can't put it in any other term, invented. It's called the numerous clauses, which dealt with only 1% of Jewish children would be permitted to enter higher education. So, I am finishing middle school. My grades are pretty good, so it's not an issue for me to go further. Plus, in those days, the parents had to pay for tuition, and that wasn't a problem either. However, I didn't make the 1%. Now, think of a 15-year-old, because the higher education starts earlier there than here. And, and, and the high school is more strict than the high school is here. Anyhow, I am not talking now history. I am not talking about intellect. I am talking about a 50-year-old kid who is hurt, period. I couldn't understand why I couldn't make it. I, I can't, I know this, you don't know how to rationalize all the political reasons and so on. I just felt that I couldn't make it. So it was a personal hurt. As I said, there are many, many, many other laws uh, bombarding us. And somehow or another, you adjust to it. Yeah, what can you do? The law is a law. 
in any nation, and you are forced to obey it or else. So, meanwhile, we have very limited knowledge of the tragedies. I mean, there are some, a very small percentage of people who managed from the other countries, who managed to come into Hungary, because at that point in their eyes, Hungary is a haven. So people are hiding them and, and trying to support them and so forth. So there are trickling of, of tragedies coming in, but not in full strength, but we to find out later on. So we are living under these conditions, and uh, in the spring of 1944, Hitler decides that Hungary is not doing enough with the final solution, which if some of you don't know what that means, that was his mantra to deal with the undesirable people in his eyes. And that was called the final solution. So anyhow, now, in the March 19, 1944, a very small group of Nazi army enters Hungary. Now here again, I just have to throw in a little something. Normally, when a, a, a country enters another country, there is a resistance. There's fighting, gunshot, etc. Zero. The Hungarian military openly welcomes the Nazis, and they start supporting all their wishes way beyond the amount that, that the, what was really needed. How did that play out? They come into Hungary March 19. Within a week to 10 days, they give orders that all the Jewish people have to have a yellow star of David very tightly sewn onto their clothing. <coughs> Ironically, even tiny children Three, four-year-old children have to have the star. Without this, you are not permitted to go out on the street or any public places. All right. It was it was hard to stomach at that point, but that's really nothing. In another two weeks' time, new order. All the Jewish people will be concentrated into a ghetto. Now here. I used to tell it to the younger people, but you are all young. So I define the terminology of ghetto. In the American mind, a ghetto is a community where an ethnic group resides. But they have total freedom of getting out and going to other part of the country. That's fine. It should be that. Fine. In real life, a ghetto is something totally different. And here it goes. We got the orders that a sec I lived in a big city. So a section of the area designated by the government officials will be allocated to become a ghetto. As it happens, I my house was has become part of the ghetto. It was a home built for uh, uh, comfortable for six people, which we were. Uh, my grandfather built a house maybe 40 years before this, it was a comfortable home. We had my parents, my brother and I, and an aunt and uncle who lived with us, six people, fine. So now comes the order for, to unite all these people. Now I have to tell you the expedience in which way all this was executed is mind-boggling, even in today's computer age. It was so systematic, it was so perfect to the absolute dot. Why? Because they had six years in the other countries to master their craft. So, listen to these statistics. In 51 days, they were able to move close to a half a million people from their home into their now forget the emotional aspect of all these tragedies. Just think, imagine walking out of your house, babies, old people, etc., walking out the door, never see any of them again, with a little bag full of, like 
like our little suit, overnight suitcase or something of that size. And so now here comes the actual motions. Uh, this section is allocated for the ghetto. But it's a big city, there are people living all over. So the Hungarian police cooperates with the Nazi orders beyond the limit, beyond. I expect that a soldier has to obey the orders. But these police were brutal, beyond brutal. So here is a section, and now they are given an order within an hour's time to pack an overnight bag and be lined up on the street. I have to throw in something here for you to understand a little better. The men in the families have been taken away within the last three, four years already because the Hungarian military was working with the, Rus with the German Nazis against the Russians. So the Hungarian soldier was taken out with the Germans to the Russian front. They took their Jewish unit and they use them as guinea pigs on the minefields. They put the Jewish boys uh, old, up to age 45 or something like that in the forefront and uh, needless to say how many were blown up, etc., etc. But the point here is that we had no men at home. So when the <coughs> family was moved out of that apartment, that was that mother, who may have elderly parents, who may have sick children, whatever the case is. And trying to tell the little one to pack her own stuff, because how much can one person do? We never think of those little things. So anyhow, this is done. The myriad of people are lined up. And now the distance between one location to the ghetto area could vary in several miles. And there was no such a luxury as carpool or buses or train ride or any of that. On foot. On foot with all these horrible people, horrible uh, guards pushing you, shoving you, hollering at you, cursing at you, anything you could imagine. Now you, the group arrives at the designated ghetto area. Now here comes tragedy on top of tragedy. It is up to that policeman to walk into a house like mine, just give it a look, take a number of people and dump them there. See, a courtesy went out of fashion, like asking maybe your old grandmother lived over there and could live with you or stuff like that, none of it. My house became the home for 40 people because, you know, this one you can't say here. If you can imagine people on top of people, pretty much <coughs> the case. And I used to tell the younger kids that I was a spoiled brat. I was a little girl, <laughs> the youngest in the family. So needless to say, uh, I was spoiled. I had nothing to be ashamed of. Which translates to, I had my own room. I had my own stuff. Now there were people of oak sitting in corners. But remember, I still had my best sleeping. They had nothing. Interestingly, at my young age, that was the time when I first learned really how to share. There was no other choice. You shared whatever you had. There were some girls my age who ended up in my house. I had a closet full of clothes, and so on. So what happened, people were sleeping in shifts because <coughs> it, it, it was a horrendous experience, horrendous. And once we were incarcerated in this ghetto area, from that point on, there were no more exit. We couldn't go to a doctor, we couldn't go, jobs ceased to exist at the minute this whole situation began. So there were no money earned or any, any uh, normal business transaction and so forth, nothing. We were locked up in this area. To tell you about the abuses, uh, that again could be a lengthy, lengthy story. But I'm going to cite two things that I coined myself. One I call the legal robbery, and I, the other one I call the illegal robbery. 
The illegal robbery consisted of uh, the Hungarian Nazi party had a young group of horrible people who were nothing but hoodlums, un uneducated kids who were paid off and riled up to hate. And there was the, the Jew, the good kitty pig. Okay? So they would come into the, very freely, were permitted to walk into the uh, ghetto. Now remember, I lived in that house for 40 years, put that in focus, and realized that it was a fully furnished home. It had valuables in it, it had, I don't have to go into details. So these punks would come in, and they're self painting. Well, maybe I can get five bucks for it or something take it up the wall and walk up to them. We, the people, were too scared to say anything, don't touch it. So I call this the illegal robbery because they could do whatever they want. But why do I call it illegal robbery? Because until that point, I was protected by the police. My generation goes back at least five times back of living in that same community. We were patriotic Hungarians, followed to the letter. All of us, up to that point, the police was protecting me as well as protecting everybody else. No more. So that's why I call this illegal robbery. Then I, let me tell you about the legal robbery. While we are in the ghetto, orders come from the government that their agents will come in such and such a time, and you have to turn over your jewelry, your cash, and other values. Okay, so you do that, and here again, it's the same idea, you cannot resist. So what are you gonna do? Cash, you, you have to understand having some cash. These were already tragic, tragic times, even prior to the Nazi invasion. So people tried to have some cash money, not knowing what tomorrow brings, that they might need to buy a loaf of bread or something. So even as little as they had, but everybody had a little bit. We were too afraid to resist and not to turn in. So we turned in all these valuables. Now why am I going at length telling you this section of it? because the money they took from us paid the Hungarian railroad worker to ship us to our bed. Life in this segment was horrendous, but it went extreme expediency. In about another four weeks, five weeks, something like that, we got an order that everyone from the ghetto will be evacuated. You just take our little bag full of stuff and that's it. So, again, the same scenario takes place. Now there are naturally many more people and we have to take our little bag full, walk out our home, never see anything of it again. That's why I have no, no strength or whatever for value, no, no respect for values in that sense of material things because it just means nothing. Anyhow, so now they are marching us through town and here came a very emotional thing. Um, on the main street was my father's business that he built through blood, sweat and tears, working six days a week, 20 hours a day and all that to make a living for us. And now there is that store, and here he is with the thousands of people marching to town. And there are some nice people who stayed behind the curtains. But then there are some nasty people who throw, throw stones at you and slurs many nasty words at us. So can you visualize my father's feelings at that moment? And he was such a giving person. He was a good friend of the mayor of the town. So as such, they would collaborate on doing charitable work. I don't know how many poor people had sandwiches at my father's business every night lined up. 
and, and many, 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 many things. And all of a sudden, all the things he has given, irrespectful to religious background, to the community, this is what he gets there. So fast forward to the end of at the end of town, and there is a giant brickyard. Now, in the brickyard, there are only bricks, zero, nothing else. They herded us in there on the dirt floor, no covering, no no support, no toilet facilities, no bedding, nothing, not just. So, so there we were incarcerated. Now they brought in the people from the provinces, and the, the, the suburban areas, and now this whole district of Jews are concentrated in the big yard. And why the big yard? Even that was cleverly planned. Because a brickyard was adjacent to the railroad tracks. Thus, they could easily get these people into the boxcars. On my 17th birthday, on June 11th, they herded us into these cattle cars. Now, if you look inside the cattle car, it would hold maybe 25 people sitting down. Everywhere between 75 to 80 people were sh literally shoved in, pushed in, slammed the door on us. There's total darkness. It's already June. It's excruciatingly hot, plus the body heat, plus the stress. So I don't have to go any further to describe. I stood for three days, squashed together, in order to allow my parents to sit on the wooden floor to describe the inside feeling of the travel of three days. You know, I'm standing here and I myself can believe the realities, but this is how it went. There were people of all personalities. They were crying, they were cursing, they were praying. Every kind of personality you study in Psychology one, it was there. I remember one very, very sad thing. A young woman sat in the corner with a baby on her bosom, but that baby was already dead. And there were many dead people, but they were not taken out. And it was dark there. The only light we got was a tiny window, not bigger than our own little TV screen that used to be. And even that had a barbed wire across it, so there was no way of escaping. We had no water. Now, with all the horrible discomfort, you can't fathom, and I hope you never ever experience what it is to be without water for three days. Your lips become parched, your mouth becomes sore, and psychologically what happens, all your other issues are pushed to the side. Your mind is totally focusing if I could only have a drop of water. And the train is traveling at a very slow pace. We have no idea where we're going because we were told that if the people will be moved, that the people will be moved to another country, because you know this is the war is coming to an end and they need laborers. And they gave us the lie number one followed by many more. What? This was, the families will stay together. Now think about it. Under these dire conditions, if they tell you that your family will stay with you, you don't resist. You just go, follow like a zombie, <coughs> follow the orders, do it, and that's it. Because you hope that this is will we'll be all over, we'll go to another country, we'll do our work, we'll come home, life will continue. Unfortunately, it doesn't work out that way. So now, we arrive totally disoriented on the third day to an unknown destination. And some strange looking men in striped uniforms open the door and some sign language, because they speak another language, order us to get out. And somehow they try to tell you that the little bit of luggage that you brought with, leave it there. You'll get it later. You never, ever got that last stitch of stuff from home back. What they have done to it, which I found out later, there was a special unit. It is called camera. I don't know where they got that thing. 
it, it, and uh, this was Auschwitz, by the way. And they have uh, had a unit that did nothing but sort through all the stuff that came from home, and if they would find valuables, that would go to the fatherland, or whatever sources they distributed to. But anyhow, so now, I, I'll give you my impression, because that's more important. We are shut down, and there's a, there are a sea of people. And you start to think, figure it out. It would have not been feasible to fill one cattle car for transport. So depending on the size of the community, they would couple together many, many of these trains. So being a larger community, it could have had maybe 50, 60 of these trains coupled together, multiply this by 80. So there are several thousand people exiting this, what they call the lab. And I look out, and I see this fans and some horrendously emaciated looking people kind of gazing. My first impression, why did they bring us to an insane asylum? That's how it took to me. Unfortunately, I found out that another day I will be in the identical position. So now, this sea of people are marching forward. The men are separated. And that's the last time I see my father and my male relatives who came with us. And now there's my mother and my other women relatives. And they're marching forward. And my cousin said to me, hold on to your mother so you don't lose each other, which was an excellent <coughs> advice, except it backfired. By the time we marched forward, there were, we were faced by a group of Nazi officers, maybe five, eight, whatever. And one of them stepped forward and they did this much. See, you were, you were no longer a person. Nobody talked to you. You had no name anymore. You, the sign language, and that's it, the foul orders, <coughs> like a zombie. So this one man stopped. So we stopped, and this one Nazi officer stepped forward and pointed an index finger at you. So doesn't need a college degree to know that you have to go this way. And to my mother, that he saw us holding on to each other. Now, ironically, my mother had a very young face. She was 42, but a very young face, so she could have easily gone to the living. What has happened, anyone who was directed dead away ended up immediately in the crematorium. And I'll describe that to you in a minute. Now, I am separated, and I waved to her, and I said, Mother, I'll see you later. And I don't know what's going on with you. I'll see you later, and I ran on because I was pushed to do the next thing. So what happens here is the most automated, systematic routine that only a scientist could envision. Uh, we go into this big room. Everybody has to disrobe, totally. Fold up your clothes, put it on the floor. You're going to get a shower. You'll get the clothes back. Now remember, that's an absolute last stitch of belonging to the past. Of course, you never get that clothing back again. That's the order. From here, we are shoved into another room, and there are some girls coming out from the side door, and they are screaming. From the top of their lungs, they are screaming, and they, and they look so funny. So your first reaction is you start laughing, because they look comical. What has happened, they shave their hair, now these are all young women, and you are all in the age how much time you spend with your hair, right? <laughs> so visualize those girls. So they are screaming, but what has been happening to them, they had the head shaven completely and all the body hair. So we are kind of giggling because we don't know what we see or why they're screaming. Little did we realize that two minutes from now we are in the identical position once we go through that room. It's a horrendous feeling. And to put insult to injury, they sprayed some disinfectant on our freshly shaven skin. From here, we went into another room which we call the shower. Forget the shower you took this morning. I mean, it's, 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 
like day and night. It was an empty room with shower heads in the ceiling, maybe 50 of them, God knows what, and literally a trickle of water would be reaching your body. That's all. No soap, no towel, no clean underwear, nothing. From here, another room, and all this is going boom, 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 real fast. A mountain of clothing. And the person is behind that and literally throws a garment at you. Don't look at you, small eye, tall eye, what, skinny. I ended up with a long slip. That's it, people. Nothing else. No bra, no panties, no stockings. And they took away our shoes and they gave us wooden sole flip-flops. God should save us from that because it is rubbing your foot and forth. So now, this is our new uh, uh, attire. From here, it's our, now remember, we've been going through now the travel. The, the, uh, we are really pretty days. And now they show us into a big room that has absolutely nothing in it. And only a wooden floor. That would hold maybe 200 people. But here again, the systematic setup. They managed to get 500 of us into that room to sleep. How? They laid us down and let's visualize the sardines in the can. We had to lay down like that. So the 500 would perfectly fit in. And our wooden slippers would become our pillow. And the body next to you, your blanket. Ironically, we were not permitted to go out to the latrines. That was the best. <coughs> latrines outdoors. A latrine was a giant hole dug in the courtyard with a wooden plank across it and some circles carved out, and that was your bathroom. There was no water, there was no paper, there was no soap, but that was the bathroom. But at night, for some unknown reason, we could not exit this encampment, so they had a bucket in the corner, need I say more. Early morning cups. What did your mother teach you? Wash your face, brush your teeth, etc. Zero. As we wore in that crumpled garment, we were shoved outdoors, and there we had to line up to be counted. To this day, I cannot understand the logic behind this count. They did it twice a day. You had to line up five abreast. And they counted you. No, no um, uh, computers and calculators, none of that. About one, two, three, four, five. And if that person who was counted came up, instead of 500, came up 492, they started again. We had nowhere to go. Now, I have to tell you where we were exactly to get you further understand. You have heard about Auschwitz proper. OK, that was the main camp. About a year before the Hungarians came, they leveled off about five villages surrounding Auschwitz and created a subcamp called Birkenau. Why? Because many people were expected to be brought in and they literally had no place even to be killed, but they had no room. So they, they threw together this camp. That's why we had, when you see photos of, of Auschwitz and other camps that the prisoners are in the bunk beds. We had none of that because we were destined to be killed because the crematorium was right in that area. So now I'll tell you about a little bit about the crematorium. We kept smelling horrendous body flesh. You know when you sear the chicken from the feather off, you know, none of you kill a chicken. Too. <laughs> and, uh, burn, burn, burn flesh. But we didn't know what it was. It was a horrible, horrible smell. And we saw black smoke spewing out of these chimneys. But maybe, well, it's an incinerator garden. Who, who could fathom the reality of it? Except we were there about a week or so there about, and we would ask the people who have been there longer, would you have an idea how soon uh, we will find our relatives again or we can connect? 
inevitably their hands would go up pointing to the chimneys and say, that's where they are. Now we came from a civilized country. I said, there's no such thing. They are out of their mind, they're out of their head. I mean, how, can, how can they kill live people just like that? I mean, you know. Unfortunately, we found out the reality of it. The reason I go into in detail about the crematorium is the selfish one. And that is, every so often, there are some smarter ones who decide that it is an invention of the Jewish people to talk about the crematorium. There was no such a thing. So, to further substantiate for people to believe that unfortunately it was true. First of all, if you think about historically, how many war events or other events were as documented up to the Second World War as the Second World War proper? I mean, it is there on track about, and there are still people over and over. Some of them are educated people, some of them are stupid. And so the reason I emphasize this part, I have a quotation from President General Eisenhower when he liberated, he and his troops liberated one of the horrendous camps in Germany. He put his soldiers <coughs> in the field where all the dead bodies were strewn all together. And this is what he said. I have never felt able to describe my emotional reaction when I first came face to face with indisputable evidence of Nazi brutality and ruthless disregard of every shred of decency. I visited every nook and cranny of the camp because I felt it my duty to be in a position from then on to testify at first hand about these things in case there ever grew up at home the belief or assumption that the stories of Nazi brutality were just propaganda. Now, if you don't believe the President of the United States, then we have to learn better. But this is the reason I, I, I emphasize this, because uh, I understand that this class is dealing with forgiveness and understanding. So I'll come to that part, too, because there are points where I can talk about that as well. I'm just going to conclude my part in Auschwitz proper, and from here, there was another word that I want to teach you, and that is selection. It's not what the English language means. <laughs> selection meant in Auschwitz language, you had to line up in a circle in the courtyard, had to be half naked, and I can guarantee you not for your sexual beauty, but they would see how strong your upper body was, and you would be selected because they needed laborers in many of the manufacturing forces. So what they would do, you would march around in circles, these Nazi officers would pick you out, and there were two forms of selection. One group was destined to be shipped out of the country, out of the place to work somewhere, and the other ones looked very emaciated and weak, were ready to be killed. I was fortunate enough to be selected to be shipped out, and I ended up in an ammunition factory in the general area of Kassel, Marburg, Frankfurt er uh, territory called uh, uh, Allendorf and Camp Münchmühle. And this was an ammunition factory built by the Nazis in 1933, and uh, they were manufacturing rockets and bombs. And ironically, until 1944, they never had female or Jewish workers. Until then, they had political prisoners and imported laborers from the neighboring countries like Belgium and France, but they were not Jewish. Anyhow, so now visualize a 17, 18-year-old girl who just came out of school, had never even seen a factory, let alone work in a factory, and you'd be surprised how fast you are forced to learn to do every everyday work. Our job was to fill the highly, poison, the highly poisonous liquid material was channeled through a tubing system into bomb. In front of our workbench was a bomb in front of this big. 
and that two being of liquid have to be inserted into the belly of the bomb, fill it, and then tighten the lock, and then two people have to lift it and carry it to the warehouse location. It was exceptionally heavy work. But what has happened about three months into this time frame, our hair started growing out like crooked size, and we looked at each other, and if your hair was black in the past, now it was orange or reddish, your face was lemon yellow, and your lips were deep dark purple. What has taken place by handling this highly poisonous material without any protection, it started affecting our body. If the war would have not finished early, early enough in this context, I wouldn't have the pleasure of talking to you. So this was a situation, it was a very hard work. As far as knowing things, what's going on in the outside world, we hardly knew what was going on. We were so uh, separated from everyone. And uh, food was, uh, that's not even horrendous. Not only was it, I was always hungry. There are two things that I tell the younger kids. I don't want, ever want to be hungry again, and I don't ever want to be cold again. Because, remember I told you I had these garments, and later on they gave us a uniform. We never had stockings, and it was bitter cold, because we had to march from our campsite to the factory in the bitter cold winter to a wooded area. It was horrendously cold. So what, you know, you improvise. It's remarkable what a human body can come up with. This poisonous material came in a powder form originally before they liquefied it. And we stole the paper sacks and wrapped it around our legs. So that became our stockings and so forth. You come up with many ideas. Nevertheless, it was very hard, very strenuous, very painful, and uh, we were living from day to day. We made another day, we made another day. That's it. The abuse was there tenfold. And at the end of March of 1945, our leader, of the, the, the Nazi leader, received an order from Buchenwald, which was the camp now we belong to as a sub-camp, given the order that we have to march from this location to Buchenwald. So if you can picture at the end of March, the wet, raining, miserable, cold period, a thousand women on an open highway, pretty weak, very little food, marching, so many, mi hundred, so many miles per day. For nights, we slept on the wet ground in the ditches. No power Johnson, no power, nothing. On the third day, we have noticed that some of the female escorts, the Nazi women guards, were disappearing. I mean, there were still some there, but not as many as before. So you know, when you are that age, you're either smart, stupid, or brave, or all three combined. <laughs> so what has happened, we noticed these women dis disappearing, and we were in a village area, a farm area, and in a distance we spotted a barn. So we figured maybe during the night, we could kind of crawl down the grass and reach the barn, like that was a safe haven. And a group of us managed, with God's help, to do it. So now we escaped and hid in this smelly, miserable barn, but we didn't care. And the following day, we looked through the little people and, you know, shaking in our boots, because if we are found, that's the end. However, God bless the American 6th Armor Division, two beautiful, soldiers were combing the area because the thousand of us dispersed. So the American uh, captain or whoever was in charge kept spotting them here and by there. So he sent out scouts. And this is how we were liberated. So in conclusion, I want to leave you with three important things. One is to protect your freedom because slavery is horrible. So let's be grateful what we have in this country and keep working 
toilet. Secondly, I want you to think before you hate. I am not telling you to hate or not to hate. That's up to your conscience. I am just asking you to think about why do I hate that person or that thing. And once you rationalize in your mind, perhaps that will be a healing way of not hating. And thirdly, I mentioned to you about the, uh, the deniers. So when you meet someone who will engage in a controversy with you, Unfortunately, you have to tell them it was the truth. So here I usually stop because there's a lot more to say about forgiveness, but I'm going to stop, and if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer, if I can. So put out your thinking cap, and uh, let's see how well we're doing. Yes? <coughs> Do you have, like, resentment in you towards all the that? The number? Do, I have Do you have, like, resentment, like, feelings? Did you towards those people, or did you, you know, in a way, forgive them since this is a suffering and forgiveness? Good question. Do I have any resentment to the, those people? All right. That's more about the clock, okay? Three years ago, I was invited to speak at an annual Eucharistic Catholic Convention in New Zealand. And I did my presentation, and I talked about what happens from slavery, because that's, that's a long road by itself. How do you assimilate to be where I am not? And after the program, I went to the private dining room, and a young man, maybe 25 years old or thereabout, approached me. May I sit down? I said, sure, I have a question, he said. And I am a great of looking into people's eyes because their eyes tell everything. And I could feel and sense that that boy wanted something. But to summarize a half hour of the most intense conversation, this is how it went. Now, as talkative as I am, that's how quiet I was. And he was asking and telling. So this is what he said. I have a favor to ask you, he yes. Both my grandparents were Nazi officers. One of them was an officer in Mauthausen, which was also a horrendous camp. And I don't know where he's going, but here we go. He said, when I go back to the church meeting and I look in the picture of Jesus Christ, I would very much like to see your face of forgiveness in that picture. Would you say it's a, it's a loaded question? I mean, you know, to be even compared or think about in this church. So, I, I'm a great believer in God's guidance because that's the only way I could answer what I answered. And here it goes. I said, young man, uh, in the Jewish religion, our highest and holiest of holidays, the Day of Atonement, we fast 24 hours and we pray. We pray to God to forgive our sins of the past year, to start the new year fresh. Among our prayers, we ask him to forgive the sins of our perpetrators. So now, young man, you can rest assured that I have forgiven your grandparents. However, I have to tell you the truth. In the early years, when the pain was so acute, I could not have made this remark. Does it answer your question? Yes. Okay. Nobody asked me. I don't have a number. The reason I don't have a I don't have a number tattooed. Let me qualify this a little further. What has happened? Remember, I told you the selection part. They were ready to get us going, but they needed help, so they omitted the tattooing itself. However, I have a prison number, 
23,675 that was sold out to the New York World. We were going to that stuff. Yeah. Were there very many Jewish individuals, whether in your town where you lived, did they lie? Did they try to not? Did they try to hide the fact that they were Honey, this was not a 007 situation. Mm -hmm. That's how I tell it to the kids. I don't mean to compare mm -hmm. you with children, but that, that's my answer because the fear, the scare of being captured and punished. You can't fathom the punishment. Let me tell you one punishment that is very close to my heart. When we were in the brickyard, my mother had an aunt who was in her maybe early 80s at that point already. But they were of some means. They worked hard. They had some money. And they knew about her wealth. They put her out of the brickyard and they tortured her to death to try to reveal where she needed her valuables. And there were many issues like that. It was the punishment was so horrendous and so painful and so demeaning that it's indescribable. So as far as there were a very small nucleus of people who were hidden by my non-Jewish people who, who escaped, but, it, but judging from a million to 10, that ratio, I mean, it was very little, because many reasons. There were some bad people, or fear, fear. I, I don't want to label them. There were some people who were petrified of being caught themselves if they protected the Jewish person. And uh, so I can understand that part of it, okay? So with this, but then there were some other people who were very, very anti-Jewish, and they would record everything. They, 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 let's say you lived in an apartment building. There was a caretaker in the building. And that caretaker knew about everyone's business. And the minute they would see some strange movement or something, they would report it to headquarters, and they would take the whole family away. So the, the punishments were so immense that there was this no way of hiding and, and, and escaping. I mean, you know, I always say that you have to live the era to understand the circumstances. Here we can live in the comfort of a room and our stomach is full and etc. It's very difficult to put yourself into that position. So uh, it, it's hard. Yes? Did you ever lose your faith at all at any moment? The faith? During faith. That's a good point. All right. Faith is a very important point in our life because uh, in my case, I was raised in a religious Jewish family, so I was a God-fearing person. But remember, I'm 17 years old. I'm not 80 or, or whatever. You know, the, the mind is not working in the same fashion. But a remarkable thing has happened. Among our people in the 500, there were some what I call older people who were maybe 10 years old. You know. In those days, that's older who were really very pious people, and they knew all the prayers by heart. Now, we had no place to hide. It was, you know, it was just a little area. But at the latrines, somehow they didn't water that closely. So we would gather at the latrines, and these people would pray and remember holidays and sing, chant some of the holiday songs and so forth. So that kept faith going. And remarkably, the atheists, when they were in trouble, what was their first word? Oh my God, help me. <laughs> so faith is a very difficult subject because when you're in trouble, you become selfish. And you think really of yourself, which is normal human behavior. So you don't think many steps. You're not a philosopher. Let's put it that way. You know, I mean, philosophy. You, know, you, 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 you Try to you try to protect yourself at that moment, what is good for you. But in the overall, that's what kept our faith. And then post-war, I'm a believer because because I have been on post-war in so many situations up and down, and somehow the good Lord just hangs around and guides me. So uh, 
If you're talking to a believer, <laughs> I can't say it any other way. Yes? Um, do you keep in contact with the girls and women you were liberated with? Okay. Have I been in contact with the ladies I was liberated with? Yes. I am a highway grandma, <laughs> and I talk on Skype. There is one more lady in Hungary who is even more active than I am. She travels all over Europe talking about her testimony. And we talk on Skype, and we exchange our happenings. And uh, earlier years, I was in touch with a few more, but unfortunately, they are leaving us. But yes, we are trying our best to keep in touch, because it is something very, very special. Matter of fact, I have a photograph of the three of us and when we were liberated. That's one of my treasured photos. So yes. Yeah. Oh, Either one of you. Um, go for it. What was your feelings and like what were you thinking when you like were free when they How does it feel to be free? Yeah, like what were you thinking the okay. day that you got free? Okay, okay, I got the answer for you. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I you know, I don't give yes and no answers. I learned, learned a long time ago that's not enough. When we were liberated by the American army, the American management arranged with the local mayor of a community to find housing for us. And then they supplied food, and then the Jewish agencies came in the picture helping with our clothing and, and so on. And what I'm leading up to is we were free to go wherever we wanted. For months after, when I would walk down the street, I always thought that the guard is next to me. I couldn't shed that feeling for the longest time. I don't know why. I knew I was free. Mm -hmm. I was living as a free person, but that guard was there. So that, that's the best way I can give you the yeah. answer. One moment. Yes. Um, can you tell us how you got to the U.S. and also, um, I, I take it since you said you're a high-tech grandma, you must have married. And so can you tell us how your husband helped you through the forgiveness and, or if he did, like my husband may, may not, so. <laughs> okay, uh, that's a very, very good question. She's interested about my post-war uh, happenings. A, I always emphasize it is very important to do volunteer work because if not for volunteers doing their job, I wouldn't be here. And that, let me give you a fast one. Are we already out of time? No. Okay. Uh, what happened was, while we were in Germany, the Jewish chaplain of the American Services interviewed us and asked many questions what our plans are for the future. And among his questions was, um, do you have any relatives around the world? And I remember that my father had two brothers and a sister who emigrated to the U.S. in the early 1900s. I only knew their name and Chicago. Okay, that was pre-Google. <laughs> Way pre-Google. The chaplain related this information to the Hebrew Immigrant Society in New York. And from there, some beautiful volunteer, whoever that person is, kept calling Chicago with the names until found my relatives. Thus, they got in touch with me, and the youth got the motion of sending me affidavit paying for my visa, ending up in America. Okay. 1946, I am in America. 1948, I meet a nice Jewish boy who was born and raised in Chicago. Now, there's a culture shock here, right? Yeah. <laughs> Interestingly, he was a very supportive individual. During the evening, we would go to bed, and he would teach me, uh, preparing me to take my, my um, citizenship test. So I had it right there, you know, I, I knew all the answers, getting ready for that. And as, as time progressed, in many other ways, he was helpful to me. And when I was a medical assistant, and I come to that part, because it's the nurses here, uh, he would help me writing my speeches and come with me to meetings and, you know, I became the president of the group and so on. So he was most supportive 
has been of the, the cultural uh, assistance. Did I sum it up for you? And there was this young lady here. I was just curious about after you uh, the liberation. Did you have nightmares for a long time and <coughs> still, or how did you get over that? Okay, the young lady is asking about nightmares post war. Yes, there were. Um, um, there was one unique one that I remember, and it, the identity would come up for months and months and years. Visualize your brickyard and the railroad cars. Okay. And for some euphoric reason, I have no idea why, I am walking away from the cattle car and waving back to the people saying, I come and save you. I don't have the answer. I'm not a psychiatrist. But they say, somehow or another, maybe deep down in my heart, I wanted to save them. But I don't know why. But that there will come a, a, a nasty nightmares coming back also. There was another one. That was really a horrendous one. Um, we are in Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, they would give us a shower, like every week or every two weeks, or God knows when. And by that time, we were pretty knowledgeable about what's going on there. This particular time, they were taking us for shower, and they had heavy iron, the wrought iron doors, black wrought iron doors, and on it were stickers. You know, from the poison bottle, the, the cross bone, but I can never say that word. Anyhow, uh, uh, pasted all over the door. And when we saw that, we got the picture that this is it. They're taking us to be guests. So the way it played out, we would go into this empty room, and there were bleachers for about, for about 50 people. If you can visualize silence to the utmost, it was beyond that. Everybody was reflecting their own life. I was 17 years old and was thinking back what I have lived or how I have lived. Because it, we, we just, it, nobody had to say a word. They just felt it and knew it. So matter of fact, once they escorted us into the shower room, it took forever forever for the trickle of water reach our body. Then we knew we were safe. So this, this nightmare also, and I usually don't even talk about this part of it because then it surfaces and then I live with this. For a couple of weeks it keeps coming back to me. But that was a horrendous one. Yes? I've been to the Dachau concentration camp in Germany and I was talking with one of the people that works there and commented and observed that it doesn't seem like they're trying to hide that part of their history. They're making it open for visitors to come and see that part of their history. Um, and he said that he didn't think that a lot of Germans really knew what was, go what was going on in their own backyard. Um, did the German government ever reach out to you and apologize? Well, no, I'm not talking about Germany. That would tie in beautifully with forgiveness and understanding. Uh, as far as the camps of today, they try to use it as an educational tool. It is, a, to a degree, a replica. But the real thing, for instance, I just can talk about Auschwitz. Auschwitz was a desolate looking gray area. There wasn't a blade of grass, there wasn't a tree, there was no shade, there was nothing. So. With all this in mind, today, and, and there were people on top of people, like ants crawling. And you were restricted to a certain corner. You could not go out to the next unit. Matter of fact, once I was slept on my face and I remember I heard about my childhood friend being in that unit. And I wanted to go greet her. And the, the guard caught me and slapped me. And like I told you earlier, I was spoiled. I was never hit. And that was a tremendous shock. And as far as, uh, you know, Dachau itself, I haven't been there, but uh, it, 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 it's hard to uh, duplicate, but at least they try to, to show it to the people. Now, as far as um, we're at the uh, forgiving part, 
All right. Now you have to visualize situations about 20 years ago. Uh, we have a Holocaust Museum in Skokie, Illinois. And it, it, by the way, I recommend it to you. It is quite educational. It deals with, it's not only a museum, but it's an educational center. It not only deals with the artifacts of the Holocaust and the memorabilia of relating to that, but it deals with genocide. And it has many programs uh, supporting the genocide related programs and so forth. Anyhow, about 20 years ago, our museum heard of a church group in Germany. And it goes like this. During the war, the church in Germany called the Church of Ascension. They were anti-Nazis, but they really couldn't do much, one way or another. About 10 years post-war, they met again, and somebody brought up the idea, what can we do now? And they formed a group, and they coined it, Action, Reconciliation, Service for Peace. And they're living up to that model. They are... Uh, what they are doing physically. They take young boys and girls who have graduated high school, and in Germany, post high school, I think they have, they used to have a year of freedom of, for social services before continuing either to the military or going on to universities and so on. So they would take this age group and they would teach them to help people. Not Jewish people, people, in all capacities, whether it's a nursing home or a uh, genocide situation and so forth. Anyhow, our museum have heard about their existence. And if I tell you that they took a giant step, a super giant step of inviting these volunteer children to work at the museum. Now you have to picture, there is the old survivor with the bag on her shoulder. The minute you say the word Nazi, or even just the word German, and they shudder. Duly so, they had horrendous experiences. And here is this beautiful young volunteer who is giving his heart and soul to make the world better. It's the most remarkable human behavior, one-on-one, on one, how you connect. If the whole world could do this, of connecting a one-on-one, -on -one, I think we would have a peaceful world. And this is how it played out. Like I said, they took this giant step of inviting this young volunteer. And I use the acronym of like the cover that fits the pot. That's how the old survivor and the young person connect them. Where do I get in the picture? I would be speaking at the museum and I would be meeting these young people, and about seven years ago, they had a darling young man, he was altogether 19 years old, and uh, I kind of befriended him, but I lived across the street from the museum, and many times they would pull me out of my bed because the speaker wouldn't show, and could you, would you, etc. So I would suggest to him, I said, you know what, why don't you bring a toothbrush, and it's bad weather, you have to travel on buses to come to work, you can sleep over, we get refrigerator privileges. <laughs> and that's how a very solid friendship developed. So much so that I Skype with him. He knows more about me than my own children. <laughs> uh, at the same time, he shares his life with me. He has finished the university. Now he works for the Jew German uh, foreign ministry. And he greets diplomats from all over the world. But I was honored with a degree at Aurora University two months ago, and he came to my graduation mm -hmm. for the event, all from Germany just for that. So, is that answer your forgiveness part of it? I don't know, you asked it, yeah. So there are many more. I mean, I am in touch with the first the volunteer who is here right now, and uh, and I uh, am in touch with Gregor, he's the young man that I talked about. His grandmother, his grandmother adopted me. I get the best German chocolate chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I get Christmas presents, holiday presents, love presents. I mean, 
Look, the pain is something that I cannot share. I mean, I told you how it was, so I, you can well understand. But at the same time, life is going on, and if I, like I said to you, if you think before you hate, then how can I preach that and not live it? Simple as that. So, you more, go. Um, I was at the Jewish cemetery in Prague, and I was just amazed by the fact that all the graves had little scrolls rolled and placed on top of the graves, and sometimes they place little pebbles, and I never knew yeah. what that meant. The pebbles is a reminder that you have visited the grave, and you said a prayer there. The prayers, are, the little pieces of paper are, have become a uh, custom of asking for whatever. You know, when they go to the Western Wall in Jerusalem, they place it piece of paper in the wall for help, for whatever reasons, but that's it. There was one more thing I want to say about the forgiveness, but I'll, I'll remember it in a minute. But uh, there, there are many, many, many avenues here. So, uh, did I address everybody? <laughs> oh, I know where I was going. Yeah, a very interesting thing. As, when I came to the U.S., uh, I had many mentors. Like I said, you know, without that, you, you don't get anywhere. I became acquainted with a doctor who was Hungarian and Jewish, emigrated to the U.S. in the 1930s. And he took a chance on me. Now, my limited education at that time, he said, would you work in my office? So in those days, 1946, 47, it was a girl Friday. I worked with him for 40 years. But that's not what I am saying here. I was with him for about, oh, maybe eight, nine, ten months, a year, something like that. He put me in the office and he said, Nega, I want to talk to you. Okay. As you have seen, we have many Hungarian and German patients. And I know how you feel. Now remember, this is a very early stage. But you have to remember that in a medical office, the medical practice, the patient comes first. So you cannot, you know, show any disrespect. This was the best advice I have received in context of forgiveness. Because it learned, it taught me how to know you as a human being without any blinders. Secondly, I, uh, these, all these patients have become my very close friends. So that answers the forgiveness part. So I think I opt out my time and I thank you for all the listening and if you have any questions to remember afterwards, tell the boss and <laughs> send me a, a question and if I can answer, I'll be more than happy to. And good luck with your nursing career. It is a crazy field, but you know what? Nothing like it. Nothing like it because, because uh, just, uh, I'll finish it for a second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And remember, the girl Friday, Friday days is not like what you have today with the allocated front desk and behind desk and hygienist and technician or what have you. I was it. <laughs> so I would call in a patient and that would be the irate patient. I mean the angry one. Beyond angry. Now remember you cannot show the step to the face and shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so I would put out what I call saccharin smile. And that is not my personality. But that was my saccharin smile smile of comfort zone. So I didn't insult. But then came the report. I would go call my patient in the next room who would hug me, kiss me, and bring me homemade cookies. <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of balanced out, which translates to it's an interesting field and nothing like it. <laughs> and thank you for Thank you very much. Uh, thank you.